Welcome to the Be The Boss Now podcast. I'm your host, Gregory Allen Dati Sedana, president and co-founder of Can't Stop, One Stop Consulting, chief creative officer of Greg Dances, and number one international best-selling author of Be The Boss Now book, 15 Key Steps to Start, Run, and Grow Your Own Business. So often people don't take risks because they are afraid of failure or rejection. As an openly gay, Filipino American who was raised in a working class, immigrant and Catholic household. These experiences shaped my values and the entrepreneur and leader I have become and led me to found and run different companies and nonprofits. I've also built a business that grew during the pandemic while creating opportunities and increasing access for people from diverse backgrounds. The Be The Boss Now podcast will lift up the stories of different folks who identify as Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian, Middle Eastern, woman, queer, people with disabilities, and those living at the intersections of multiple of these identities. I believe there is a boss in all of us, especially for those of us who have historically lacked representation and leadership. Furthermore, when we embrace fear and failure as inspiration to guide us on our journeys, it will be for the better and in service to making our biggest, boldest, most audacious dreams a reality. Yoteka L. Edi is the founder and CEO of Full Circle Strategies, LLC, a social impact consulting firm committed to advancing transformative change and global impact. Described as the Olivia Pope of Silicon Valley by Forbes magazine, Joteka is a dedicated and seasoned strategist with more than 20 years of experience in policy advocacy and movement building. Within her current practice, Joteka works with clients, including corporate, nonprofit, foundations, technology, and government organizations seeking to advance policy, ideas, and change. Joteka has led regulatory, legislative, and social impact initiatives at the federal and state level for leading nonprofits and within the C-suite of leading technology companies helping to bridge the gap between Washington, D.C. and Silicon Valley. Joteka has served at the forefront of efforts that have created lasting change. In 2020, she founded the movement, hashtag Win With Black Women, an intergenerational, intersectional group of Black women leaders representing business, sports, movement, politics, entertainment, and beyond. Hello, and thank you, Salama, gracias, Joteka, for being a guest on the Be The Boss Now podcast, uh, where we help people understand they have the agency and freedom to decide what a boss means for them, live their wildest dreams, and make change in their communities. Um, so welcome. We're so excited to have you as a guest. And to kind of uh, get things going, our first question for you is, what does it mean to be a boss for you? Oh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm super excited. One, because I'm a big fan of you. Congratulations on your book and this podcast. So, you know, being a boss, you know, a boss has meant many things to me over my life. Uh, early a part of my life, boss was the person that you reported to at your job. Uh, I think as I've evolved, I've realized that a boss is exactly the essence of who you are. To me, being a boss is, it's an essence. It's, it's, it's just, it's a vibe. It's, it's how you interpret it, your own power and how you exude that power into the world. And to me, that's what a boss is. A boss is someone who lifts as she climbs. A boss is someone who leads um, from within. A boss is someone who recognizes that you're in a constant state of learning. And ultimately, a boss is someone who is thinking about others and knowing that it is something much bigger than the individual uh, and that you're a part of a greater collective. To me, that's that's what boss is. But, to, but boss is, 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 is not necessarily a, a noun, but I, I think 
boss can be an adjective. It can be an adverb uh, and definitely a verb as well. I, I appreciate that. And a lot of what you're saying um, really resonates. Um, I'm wondering, you know, you, you kind of alluded to this in, in the start of your answer around it's, it's, a, it's kind of evolved for you, especially as you kind of gone through life. Have there been any particular moments or experiences that um, you say have kind of that helped you le- like lead you to this understanding of what a boss means or, or examples that you think we could, could help illustrate how you got to this um, definition and understanding? Yeah, I, I think it's been many things. First, it's been people around me, bosses, examples of, to me, what it is truly means to be a boss that, um, you know, that definition of a boss that is a leader from within, it's really come from seeing others be that type of boss that I have ascribed and, you know, continue to strive to be. And that's really been the greatest impact. It's just sort of seeing women and men, largely women that I admire, operate in a way. And you just sort of sit back and you're like, I see you. Like, I see how you're leading. I want to lead like that. And that's really helped change and evolve. And then also it's just been really just sort of seeing the world. Um, You know, I come from a very small town in South Carolina. And so the, the word boss, you know, really growing up, it was, you know, you went to a job and you had a boss. And so that's what sort of boss meant. And sort of as I've evolved, as I've traveled, as, as I've seen uh, various parts of the country and the world, I've seen various definitions of boss. And, and that definition of boss has evolved to, you know, you could be your own boss um, and you can be bossy in a very wonderful uh, and a, an extremely uh, collective way. I, I appreciate that. And as you were talking about coming, you know, from a small, a small town in, in South Carolina, I'm reflecting on kind of even wh- the, where I grew up in Sacramento in Cal- California, which um, I grew, grew up in the suburbs there and like, I, I think as you as you were talking, I was reflecting on like, you don't know what you don't know. And so as at least for me, and it sounds like in similar in your, your case, as you got to see more things, got to experience more things that just um, uh, provided an opportunity to one learn, to grow, to um, and also just to, uh, to shift and, and shape kind of our values and um, goals and visions and um uh, and one thing in particular that I've really been reflecting as I've been following you on your journey, Joteka, is that you've kind of spanned multiple sectors. Um, I know that we met in a nonprofit public policy realm. I know you're, you've, you've um, been in organizing. I know you've in, you're in tech and in media. Um, and so I wanted, I would love if you can share a little bit about what, um, help you like bust out of the box and, and and able to kind of move from sector to sector? And was there a common denominator as you were kind of going into these different fields? Um, and, and, and was there any uh, motivation that drove you to the respective or particular organizations that you um, went to? Interestingly, if I look back at my career, if anybody looks at my career, they're like, oh, she's been at the NAACP. She's worked in uh, the United Nations, she's, you know, Silicon Valley, media, how does it all connect? And for me, if I had to best describe it, I would describe it as, you know, the windy path forward. Um, and, you know, having worked in Silicon Valley and tech, you know, when you build a tech platform, it's called stacking, like you stack tech platforms on top of each other. And that's sort of how you create great technology. And much like, a tech platform, my career has been like that. I think the through line for me has always been impact. It has always been, how are we taking people that are pushed to the margins and putting them back to the center? And so um, my inspiration for everything I do, it goes back to how I grew up. So I grew up in the small town, 1,400 people, uh, 1,491 people, one red light, McDonald's in 1995. And I grew up on a dirt road to give you a sense of just how intimate and small my town I grew up in is, and it continues to be. But, 
you know, the first time I had an opportunity to attend a national conference, it cost $3,000 and it was $3,000 extra dollars that my family didn't have. And it was the people of my community, often people who didn't have a whole lot. Um, they raised the money to send me to this conference. And, and that really was a, a, a real igniting point in my career. And I have always thought about those people who invested in me, the community that poured into me, that made me the woman that I am, as the people that I often think about in all the work that I do. And so, you know, I started my career in criminal justice reform. A lot of people don't know that about, about my work. I, I spent probably about maybe eight or nine years in and out of death rows, working on death penalty cases and worked um, on uh, the landmark Supreme Court case, Roper v. Simmons, which is actually, I believe, the most important work that I ever did in my life was the work to abolish the juvenile death penalty. And so that work really solidified for me the importance of organizing, being a connector and being rooted in community. And ever since then, my, my work began to evolve, but it evolved really from a basis of organizing around, you know, communities that were being marginalized. And you and I met uh, when I was doing more political organizing and political strategy work, because, you know, I went from being, you know, quote, an expert in death penalty reform to how do I just take uh, bases of strategy and organizing and apply that to other progressive issues, whether that's expanding health care or the work at the time to end the war in Iraq or, um, you know, work around investing in America's true priorities, which is its people. Um, and then just sort of took that on to political and working with the NAACP and civil rights. Uh, and then where the sort of biggest shift in my career came is at a time when I was at the NAACP and I had been the senior advisor to the president of the NAACP for probably about six or seven years. And I got a call uh, to go into Silicon Valley. And for me, it was like, it didn't seem like a match. It was like, I'm very busy fighting for voting rights. I'm very busy fighting for criminal justice reform at the NAACP, and I love it. I don't see myself in this industry. And what I was told and what I now realized is that there was an actual dire need for people who were organizers, uh, people who had a true understanding of community and people who were strategists to go into tech, particularly like in 2013 and 2014, when there was not as many uh, Black executives in tech. And so I went into tech and I basically was applying the same skill set of an organizer, a strategist, a connector, but doing that for large scale tech companies and tech organizations. And that work, um, you know, has evolved and continue to evolve. And so I just really see it as all connected because ultimately I've just been an organizer in all these various places and, and spaces with the goal of really having a through line of, of social impact along the way. Thank you, Jotaka. Um, I appreciate the, the through line that you're offering. And also what I'm also hearing is this groundedness around our interdependence, because it sounds like you know, from the folks that help support you go to that first conference to the many kind of folks who help to provide support and guidance in your journey that like we 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 can't do these things on our own. Like we are part of and connected to much broader networks. And so it's I like to talk about our interdependence, like, like even for myself, I'm like, there is no way that I can say that I got to where I'm at without the support and love and the care of family, loved ones mentors and femtors and 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 other folks who provided support and guidance along the way and so i appreciate you kind of bringing that in too as part of how you were able to have the support moving from sector to sector and also taking what i think um i agree are very applicable skills from from an organizing context and bringing it to these um other sectors um to, to dig in a little bit more in your experience in Silicon Valley, you know, you, you kind of talked about the, um, the kind of a growing need or the representation, especially in the year that you went, there weren't as many black executives. Um, can you can you share a little bit more like what would you tell people of color and, and women and particularly um, women of color who are interested going into tech? 
Like oh. what, 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 um, what needs to, what do you think can be or should be done to create a more inclusive or equitable world um, and, and, and tech for women and, and people of color? Well, the first question I would tell uh, people of color, particularly women of color, that there's a need for us in tech. There's a need for us in every aspect. There's a need for us, you know, in these companies. There's a need for us in the C-suite of these companies. There's a need for us to found uh, and be founders of companies. There's a need for us to be on boards of companies. And there needs uh, to be more of us in the funding realm, in the VC realm, that's actually releasing critical funding to all of these companies and, you know, investors. So there's a whole tech ecosystem. The, the entire nation and world is moving uh, very quickly around technology. If you think about just our day to day lives, like when you go to, you know, the way we enjoy entertainment is through tech platforms now. Uh, when you go and even service your car, it is through tech platforms. Um, every aspect, how we order our food is through tech platforms. And it's even changed. And now even inside of restaurants, people are using technology. You know, people, I, last time I went to a restaurant, I had to take a photo of a QR code and that's how the menu came up and I paid everything on a tech platform. Someone is developing those tech platforms. And more importantly, someone is profiting off of the use of those tech platforms. And so it's not enough for us to be massive users of technology because particularly people of color, we over index in the use of technology, but we are underrepresented across every aspect of the tech platform. We're underrepresented in terms of the number of employees. We're underrepresented uh, in, in terms of the number of us that are funded founders in tech, and we are absolutely underrepresented as it relates to the dollars that we receive. I mean, just as an example, Black women receive less than 0.1% of venture funds uh, for our tech ventures. I mean, if you, you could, there's probably about 50 Black women who've received over $1 million in venture funds. That's not, you know, a good statistic at all. And when you look at the fact that Black women are the most educated demographic in this nation, we create and we start companies at a faster rate than any other demographic in this nation. And we also carry a large amount of capital investment uh, in buying power in this country. You have to ask yourself, why is it that we don't have the same opportunities? Um, and it's largely because um, there's just an underestimation in terms of our power, um, and we're largely overlooked um, in, in, in those industries. Now, there are many success stories, you know, folks like Morgan DeBron at Blavity and Julia Collins and Jewel Burke uh, Solomon and, and others that have done really great things in tech, but there are so many other Black women that have that same potential as those great women uh, that have not been offered those opportunities. And it's important for us to shed light on this. Uh, it's important for us to get out of our own way and make sure that we're taking our rightful place in the industry. And it's important for us to make sure that we are lifting up those women in tech because I'm a firm believer it's very hard to, uh, to, to want to be something that you cannot see. Um, and so representation absolutely matters. So it's important that we shine a light on people like Jewel Burke Solomon uh, and Morgan DeBron and, and Phaedra uh, Lampkin Ellis and others who have done a really great job and have been very successful as Black women founders in the tech ecosystem. So inspiring, Jotika, and an important reminder of um, how folks help pave the way, help create space and opportunities for others. And part of what I'm hearing you say also is like, that's also part of our responsibility as, as we take up this leadership and these opportunities that how are we continuing to find more ways and opportunities to get more of our people um, who share our values and um, to, to kind of uh, be on that journey too and, and, and be able to take up that space in leadership. Um, so Thank you for being such a, a shining example of, of what that is in, in real time. Um, 
Mm-hmm. And we, have I mean, to, I, <laughs> we have to absolutely lift as we climb. And as those are not my words, those are Mignon Moore's words. And I believe she got it from someone who's passed that on to her. But we we have to, when we walk into a door, I've been, you know, fortunate. I don't know if that's the word necessarily, but I've been the first black woman in many spaces. I've been the first black woman in a tech company, several tech companies. I've been the first black woman executive, a C-suite executive at tech companies. I've been first black woman, you know, student body president, University of South Carolina, all these things. uh, When we become first or we are the only in the room, but it's not enough to just be happy with being the first or being the only. It's like when you get in a room, for me, there's a deep obligation to ensure that not only am I creating space and opportunity for others to get into the door and to get into that room, but I'm also making it easier for them once they get into that room so that we can you know, remove the hinges and widen the doors so that others can come in. I think that is an obligation to those that are in these spaces and places. And when you're in these rooms, it's important not just to be happy to be in the room. You have to speak truth to power. You have to pause, call the question. Uh, that's, 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 you know, yes, do your job. Uh, you know, these are companies that want to grow and, you know, they, they want to gain considerable market share in whatever area they're in. But there's also, I think, a responsibility to your people. And, and for me, every time I've been in a room, it's, it's sometimes I, I have to raise the uncomfortable questions. Um, but I think that is often the unfortunate, um, and some would say unfortunate, I actually see it as power. Um, to be able to to speak truth to power. And some people feel like maybe they don't feel like they want to have to do that. But I feel like there's an obligation uh, when you're blessed to be in some of these rooms. Because again, as you said, I'm a firm believer that none of us got to where we are alone. Like I absolutely know I would not be sitting here if it had not been for absolutely my ancestors and my grandparents and those people who prayed and fought for me to be in these rooms um, and for people who along my life invested in me, like those folks back in my hometown of Johnsonville who said, we're going to make sure she goes to that conference. And then people who have mentored and sponsored uh, me throughout my life, people who actually took an active role in my career and an active role in helping me get into rooms. I think sometimes people find themselves in rooms and they think they got themselves in that room themselves when actually maybe somebody mentioned your name and, and got you on the list and you don't even know it. And so I think it's important for you to always be grateful when you're in these spaces um, and also determine how you can actually pay it forward. Uh, th- throughout your career, Joteka, you kind of also gave a couple of examples. I've known you to kind of shatter multiple glass ceilings and, um, as you're continuing to talk, really help create pathways forward for generations to come, especially as many folks don't see ourselves and our people represented in tech, in media, in politics, or at least I, I, I recognize that there's there's shifts and there's things that are changing in, in dynamic ways, um, but likely still a lot more opportunities for growth. Um, and so, you know, as you're talking, I'm curious, like when you are the first and, or the only Um, what do you bring into that space and what gives you the confidence and the ability to believe in yourself? And like you say, to speak that truth to power. The first thing is just a real sense of gratitude and a grounding, recognizing particularly when you are the first. And and I, I, I reflect back on Uh, when I became the first black woman student body president at the University of South Carolina. And I was very young at the time, but I also understood the magnitude of what was happening because this is uh, an institution that was plagued with racism. We did not integrate until 1963. Um, And this was not many years following. This was 2001. And I ran for student body president at a time. um, There were, you know, the Confederate flag was hanging. Uh, on top of the state house dome. And I was very opposed to that. It was used against me when I ran for student body president. Um, But when I was elected, it was 
not only for me, I recognize that I would not have been there had not students like Henri Monty Treadwell, who integrated the University of South Carolina, actually had the courage to walk on that campus and to go to those classrooms despite racial slurs and threats in 1963. Uh, I realized that there had been multiple Black women before me who had ran and they didn't win. They deserved to have won, but because of the campus and how, uh, you know, it unfortunately, there was not necessarily an acceptance of Black women in leadership at the time before I ran. Um, but I recognize that those women paved the way for me. Had they not run and sort of opened the door, I, I couldn't have run. And, and so I realized that, you know, here's me at, I think I was 18 or 19 and this university was, it had been 210 years. Um, and this university that had been plagued with racism and here I was a, a, a symbol. I think it was about two years ago. So I, I'll share um, a story about why representation matters. I was on a win with Black Women call and a woman on the call raised her hand and she said, hey, I want to share something. And I was like, OK. And she goes, you may not remember me, but nearly 20 years ago when I was in high school, I was on a trio program trip to the University of South Carolina. She said, I'm from North Carolina. I went to the University of South Carolina. She said, I remember as a young black girl, just thinking to myself that I wasn't seeing other black women on campus. And she shared that she remembered them taking her to the student government office. And she met me. She said, you may not remember it. You were so nice and you talked to us. And they were like, she's the student body president. And she said she just remembered thinking, oh, my goodness, this black woman is in charge of the whole university. She's the student body president. And she said that day I inspired her to want to be student body president of her university. And she went on to Spelman College, where she became student body president of Spelman College. And 20 years later, we're on a win with Black Women call. And we're connected. And for me, that was just this moment of recognizing, you don't know, you have no idea where you are, what you're doing. Somebody is watching. Somebody can be inspired. And so this was this young woman who I really honestly didn't remember. I mean, I remember students would come on campus, but me, my, my presence, just my physical presence as a black woman, seeing me inspired her. And so, I, and, and I can only imagine the countless young women that she's inspired. And so for me, it was just this touching moment to, to reinforce the importance of representation and for us just to show up. Uh, just to show up and just to be and, and what that can do for other women alongside you and women that are coming behind you. That's such a beautiful story. Thank you for, for sharing that. It, um, it is bringing up for me, you know, a lot of times when I'm, when I myself am doing like public uh, speaking engagements, I always mention that I'm gay. And I, there was a couple of times where people were like, why do you why do you feel like that's such an important thing to do to share share with people that you're gay? And I told, and I said, well, I share for two main reasons. One, I want to honor and name the how far we have come and how far, um, and, and me being able to have the opportunity or moment to say that I'm gay. Um, and two, how much more work we have to do, um, because I know that while we have made advancements and while there are more out. Um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender folks, there is a lot more needed for equity and justice. Um, and I, I think about multiple folks at these different conferences com coming up to me just saying, hey, I, I am gay or I'm a lesbian or I'm trans. And you you sharing, just sharing your story and being able to be uh, like here as a uh, and to know that we have people who who are like us or who share these experiences is is um, to your point, um, you don't realize or understand the impact and you may not. So how do you live in your full truth? How do you live, bring your full selves into any space you're in, knowing that 
there is a, a, a chance or an opportunity for you to inspire, for you to um, encourage, to be encouraging to someone, especially if they might be having a bad day or who, who have lots of questions or wondering what, um, you know, what's next, what, what's their next steps or what their next dream or vision is going to be, right? Like seeing you inspired her to become student body president of her um, university. And so um, I am I'm inspired and just continue to be reminded of like, our roles in doing that. And part of me, that's part of being a boss. It's like, if we can be our full selves, if we, if we can help inspire others to be their full selves, that is part of how we build an ongoing generation and cadre of, of more, even more bosses. Um, I, I, I want to shift a little bit because I'm, I'm thinking a lot now about um, uh, failure and rejection and how often people sometimes don't take risks because they are afraid of failure or rejection. Um, in, in, in my journey, I found that experiencing setbacks have actually taught me some of my own greatest lessons and strengthened my sense of self. Can you um, tell us about a time when failure or rejection was your friend? Mm. I don't think we talk about failure enough. And I, as much as I love technology, as, as much as um, technology has been a very important part of particularly the last uh, several years of my life. I also think that it is a perpetuator of the notion that everything is often perfect in most people's lives and it could be the furthest thing from the truth. I, I think that we need to embrace failure more. And I don't necessarily like to think of it necessarily as failure, but the, the lessons, the lessons that we learn throughout life. And, and for me, um, you know, there, there are two that, that, that stick out. Um, I, I'll talk about one. It's, it's really the, when I transitioned into Silicon Valley, when, when I went into tech in Silicon Valley, I was very reluctant. Uh, I dealt with imposter syndrome, um, you know, not feeling like I belong, you know, despite I had, you know, helped win a Supreme Court case. I lobbied in the UN and, help expand voting rights and, you know, states across the country, I still didn't see a, you know, a, a place for myself. Um, but I, you know, mustered up the courage, pushed along by many mentors and supporters and friends. And when I went into the industry, it was very public because at the time there had not been a transition for many people like myself into the tech industry. And so it was a very public thing. It was, you know, a big leap for me because I was leaving like a career in civil rights at the time to go do this new thing. But eight months into my journey into tech, uh, the company that I first went to work with um, had what was called a reduction in force. So basically I was impacted by that and I no longer had a job. And I remember feeling a range of emotions. I felt like a failure, I felt like I had let down all of my friends. I was embarrassed. I was like, oh, no, like I, I did this very public thing. And here now it didn't work out. Uh, now, when I think on it, I'm like, it's just a thing that happened. It happens all the time in tech companies. Um, you just kind of go to the next thing. Uh, but for me, if you could imagine you grew up your whole life and everything has been about like a job and you stay in a job and a career for many years, um, tech is very different. A lot of people stay in a tech company for two, maybe three years and they go to the next thing. Um, but it was very, you know, devastating for me. And I remember feeling very embarrassed. I remember feeling uh, very much like a failure. And I remember just being incredibly sad about what had happened. Uh, I didn't want to see people. And there was this video that I saw on Facebook. And it was a video of Oprah Winfrey. And she was speaking at Stanford University. And in this talk, at the end of the conversation, they asked her, did she have any other comments? And she set up and she says, there are no mistakes. There are no mistakes. And I felt as if Oprah was talking directly to me when she said this. She says that marriage that doesn't work out, that job doesn't work out. It is simply the universe, just to paraphrase what she was saying, it's simply the universe moving you in the direction that you are divinely meant to walk. 
And at that moment, it became clear to me that I had a choice. Either I was going to sit here and sulk and I was going to feel sorry for myself about something that I had no control over that had nothing to do with my talents or, you know, my skill set and everything to do with outside funding source. Or, you know, was I going to sort of recognize that this was a pull in my life, a, a different, you know, this was a pull in a different direction. And honestly, had it not been for that moment, I probably would not be here today. You know, after that moment, my career took, you know, this massive leap forward. I went to another company. I became a C-suite executive. Um, I became a board advisor to many tech companies. Um, things just sort of really went amazing for me. And now here I am, you know, now I own my own company. I'm an investor in many, many tech companies. I'm a board advisor to several tech companies. Um, and I've helped many tech companies grow um, and scale not only impact, but also revenue. And so I think back on that moment of, you know, feeling like a failure. And I think that often happens to us. And I think the important thing for us is to recognize the lesson in all of these moments. You know, there have been so many times, you know, in my organizing, uh, you know, you know, the work that I've done. And, and I mean, I worked on death penalty cases. And so uh, a loss or not winning or feeling like you didn't, if I would have did this, maybe this person wouldn't have been ultimately executed and, you know, justice, injustice prevails. Um, so there, there are many different consequences and, and not to compare those type of failures. But I, I think often we have to ask ourselves, what are the lessons? You know, what did I learn from this? How can I grow from this? What do I take from this? How do I build strength from this? And how do I take that strength and move it to the next thing? And whether or not that was, you know, losing a, a battle around a death penalty case, you know, how do I actually take the lessons learned and try to ensure that we create justice for the next person or whether or not that's just a setback in life? Um, because often I think setbacks can set us up for great success in the future. If we kind of just really reconfigure how we think about things, you know, I'm, I'm definitely the girl that thinks of the glass as half full um, and not half empty. Uh, and I think similarly, when we think about setbacks, if we think about them that way, we think about them as lessons, I think that we can grow from them and evolve uh, from them. Mm, I appreciate that. We appreciate you tuning in to the Be The Boss Now podcast, and we'll be back after this short break. If you find the conversations with these entrepreneurs inspiring and want to buy a book that offers a more practical framework for realizing your business potential, I invite you to visit bethebossnow.com to purchase your copy of the Be The Boss Now book. Honestly, as I shared with my therapist in a conversation that inspired me to write my first book, this was the guide I wish I had when I first started my company, especially as someone with no inheritance or previous business experience. The book became a number one bestseller on Amazon in the one hour business and money short reads and corporate finance categories and has been featured in classrooms, nonprofits, government agencies and corporate offices. Furthermore, if you know someone who could benefit from a structured program, support and being in community of entrepreneurs, please nominate them or consider applying. We've been hosting virtual sessions and are exploring the idea of in-person cohorts by geography in the future. So you don't want to miss out. Please visit bethebossnow.com to buy the book, nominate a boss, sign up for the newsletter, or take the leap for yourself today. And, I, and, and as a follow-up to that, um, where do you think... How do you how do you think folks formulate or understand if the glass is half full or half empty or if they see a setback or, or a lesson? Like, do you, is there a, a, a place you think that that comes from or something that helps helps people think or understand it in that way? And if so, 
how how could we support or help shift that as as we become more aware, as we learn and unlearn? Um, curious your thoughts on how we can support more folks having some of these perspectives. I think it's talking about it more. I think the first thing we have to do is acknowledge. I just wish it was a day that, you know, people would on social media would just acknowledge like this is, you know, this is where how I messed up this week. You know, make it very real for people. I think that's the first thing is just acknowledging that we are not perfect. We are perfectly imperfect humans. Mm. And that is so important for everybody to understand is that we were not built to be perfect. Indeed, I believe that God intended for all of us to be masterpieces. But even the best masterpiece has slight imperfections that actually make them unique and perfect. Um, to, 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 I mean, it's sort of kind of like throwing it on his head, but that's like my, my ultimate belief. And I think we, we need to own it more and talk about it. I, I think it's also important for us to think about um, our perspectives on just evolution and growth. You know, every day, and I've been doing this every day this year, I wake up in the morning and I say, Joteka, you have a choice. Either you're going to evolve or you're going to repeat. And not every day I evolve. Some days I'm in a slum of repeat, repetition, kind of fall into a slumber. But it is my hope and my prayer that I will evolve more than I repeat. And I think it's important for us to give ourselves grace, to give ourselves space and to love on ourselves enough to say, it's okay when you don't get it right. But what's more important is that when you set back or when you repeat, that you recognize that there's space and room for you to bounce back and evolve and to grow. And I think that's what it's going to take. It's going to take us giving ourselves grace and space and giving each other space and grace and saying it's okay. It's absolutely okay. It's all right. Um, you know, and the more we do that, I think we can then truly be the boss. Mm. We truly be our whole authentic selves because society has led us to believe that we have to operate and live inside these unnecessary boxes created. And boxes are something that suffocates us. And I think when we think about our friend circle, or we think about even just how we put parameters around our own selves, our own thoughts, our own dreams, that when you find yourself in a box, it's uncomfortable. It's, it's, we're not meant to be in boxes. And I think we have to start breaking out of those boxes um, and allowing ourselves to be authentically whoever it is that we want to be. And when you are able to be who you want to be, now, my friend, that is truly being a boss. Mm. That's the definition of a boss. You are such a gem, Joteka. I, I, we, we met when um, I, was, I started with the United States Student Association. And one thing that I, uh, we used to say as a joke, but I think as I'm like, um, advancing in my career, it's like less of a joke, but just part of life around, you know, we're lifelong students and that le that learning goes beyond the walls of a classroom and that there's a, a certain level of humility and, and, and to knowing that the openness that you can learn and get new lessons from other folks and that in addition to you offering things that like part of this is is this collectivity and ability to kind of learn and grow and challenge and um, unlearn together. Um, and so I, 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 I love you saying like perfectly imperfect humans, because I think I think um, we, we, have, we are so socialized and forced to be perfect, to have to be at a certain level. And it's and um, sometimes it's like, well, based on whose standards and how are we actually how are we actually flipping it on its head to say like how can we be our best selves and how can we support and create culture and spaces where that allows us to be our best selves to be our truest selves our fullest selves and so my heart is so warm just hearing you talk about what that means and knowing that um, and seeing you in different places and spaces being able to to bring that to life and to to 
offer like in real time examples and in spaces where folks can do that. Um, and that's, I guess that's a big vision and dream of mine is like, how do we, how do we have this be felt by everyone? Everyone deserves joy. Everyone deserves happiness and um, the ability to be their full selves. And so may, may all of our collective efforts continue to bring that kind of peace and um, uh, inclusiveness and justice and liberation for, for us all. Um, I'm, uh, another question I would love to ask you is, um, as you are reflecting on this incredible journey that you've been on so far, and I can only imagine what's to come, when you think about the younger Joteka, the younger Joteka before she had a chance to go to this conference, before she um, ha uh, left, had uh, uh, moved from this uh, small town in South Carolina, is there anything that you would tell her um, um, then that um, after the experiences that you've had through the years? Mm. You know, I, I would tell younger, younger Joe Take. You know, younger. <laughs> well, one thing I would tell her is absolutely okay to have talks too much on your report card. <laughs> I used to get talks too much on my report card all the time. And it used to scare me. And now sort of if I could go back to that girl and say, you know what, girl, that talks too much is going to work for you one day. Um, girl, you're going to have a television show. Uh, you go, you, you know, you're going to, talk for a living um maintain it but it's okay um but in all seriousness the thing that i mostly would tell her is that she's enough that she's absolutely enough that throughout you know the journey society is going to reinforce this idea that you're not enough whether or not what you see on television what you read on books what people may say to you how people may treat you. They may lead you to second guess your worth and who you are, but you are someone that comes from a long legacy of greatness and that you are absolutely enough and to just enjoy the journey, take it in, live in gratitude and know that it only gets better. Please, please forgive me. I, I, I meant younger Joteka because you are still young Joteka. Um, <laughs> but I meant the younger Joteka that before before you've had um, the, the 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 journey that you that you have been on. So um, I stand corrected and apologies. <laughs> You should um, be younger. I am getting a little bit older, though. You know, I start to look around and I hear songs and I'm like, who's this? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I am dating myself. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I hear a, 70s a term. Baby. I'm a 70s baby. Uh, I hear a term that people are, are using is they're seasoned. They, they're I'm seasoned. seasoned. <laughs> I'm a seasoned baby. I'm well seasoned. You're well seasoned. I'm well seasoned, baby. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I am um, in, I'm, I'm just, I'm actually sitting here reflecting and thinking about the younger Joteka and, um, and the, those affirmations that you're offering and um, hoping that that could be a, a word of, although it could be words of, and gems of inspiration and aspiration for others. Um, Cause I, I, I know that as I've been learning, it's it, one thing that I'm taking is like, it's never too late. Like you can, it, no matter it, it, no matter your age, no matter um, whatever your circumstance, if you have a dream and a vision and a goal, like it's never too late to go for it. Um, and I am hoping that hearing folks, folks hearing from bosses like yourself to take and others on this podcast, that they will feel inspired to take that leap of faith. They will feel inspired to work, to, to spend that time and energy on their exciting idea and bold aud audacious vision they have for the world. I mean, so thank you um, for being who you are, for taking some time to be on the Be The Boss Now podcast and for continuing to be an ongoing inspiration, even for myself. I, I, I feel really grateful to have been able to continue to share space, but especially this opportunity to um, uh, have more folks get to learn more and love the Joteka that I, I've been able to get to know through the years. I am so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm I'm grateful and I'm inspired by you. And uh, you know, as our good friend David John often says, iron indeed sharpens iron.
Thank you, Joe. Take care. Thank you for checking out the Be The Boss Now podcast with your host, Gregory Allen Datu Sedana, president and co-founder of Can't Stop, Won't Stop Consulting. We believe you can and will be a stronger entrepreneur, embracing fear, honoring failure, and remaining humble enough to be teachable. Check out our book, this podcast, and other resources available for those of you current or aspiring bosses at BeTheBossNow.com. Be sure to follow Can't Stop, Won't Stop Consulting or myself on all major social media platforms at CSWS Consulting and at Gregory Sandana at G-R-E-G-O-R-Y-C-E-N-D-A-N-A. More information can also be found on our website at cswsconsulting.com. The Can't Stop, Won't Stop Consulting team would also like to thank the following people who are critical to the production of the Be The Boss Now podcast. Vanessa Shilawala of Thrive Spice Media, executive producer. Melissa Kelly Calibri, accessibility coordinator. Darren Rousseau, Hollyfield, and Stephanie Chow, American Sign Language interpreters. And also all my family, friends, educators, and anyone, including the naysayers, who played a role in shaping the boss I am today. This is for you and for everyone with an idea of starting a business. Let this be a guide, light, and motivation. We all can be the boss now.